22, and we're going to start, start in verse 22 and read through 35. So Luke records this, And when the time came for the purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons. Now there is a, a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this, was, this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, for you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for, your glo for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. So that their thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we come to you this morning and we love you so much. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this house. And God, I pray that as we dive into your word today, Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom. God, give us understanding. God, give us direction. Anoint my mouth and hide me behind your cross, Father. I pray that you would be sufficient where I'm insufficient. And God, that you would draw us closer to you today. Lord, we love you so much and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, do you have your Christmas shopping done yet? Oh, yeah, maybe. Well, I don't. I don't have my Christmas shopping done. I was thinking this week about how Christmas shopping has changed just over like the last few years. And so some of you may remember this and some of you may not. But there was a time uh, in history that you actually had to get out of your house. Like get out of your pajamas to do your Christmas shopping. Uh, many of you, you might remember this. And in case you don't, know, I'll fill you in what will happen. You would, uh, when you had to buy somebody a present, you would get in your car and you would drive to a mall. And at the mall, you would go and find the store where you wanted to buy the present. And then you would look around, and if you couldn't find the present, you would talk to somebody, and they'd point you in the right direction. You'd pick out what you wanted to buy, you'd walk to the counter, and you would pay for it. And then you would go home. Okay. Now, you just log on to Amazon, a couple clicks, put your credit card in, and it arrives two days later. Right? That's how we're doing Christmas shopping now. That's how I do my Christmas shopping for the most part. But I'm not hating on Amazon. I, I really like using Amazon or ordering stuff off the internet. But I have a problem. I have a problem with it. It's that I can't wait for it to get here. And so when I order something off the internet, I, I look at the estimated delivery dates. You know, it'll say that in the corner. And then every 30 minutes after that, I check the tracking details to see exactly where my package is. And I want to know uh, when it leaves the, the person I bought it from, and I want to know what truck it's on, and I want to know its GPS location. And if I, can, if I can manage it, I will be home on the day that it's supposed to be there so that I can meet the UPS man at his truck to get my package. Is anybody else like that? You're not like that? Well... That's how I do it, and, and when I'm at home waiting on my package, every, every noise that I hear, it's like, is that the UPS man? And I run to the window, and, and usually it's not, but I get so excited when that big brown uh, truck van thing that they drive pulls into my driveway. And 
I feel like that that sense of anticipation, that sense of expectation is a good description of Simeon's life. And so in this story that we've read today, um, it's written by, recorded by, this guy named Luke, and he was a doctor that was paid to record the story of Jesus. And he was paid by this man, Theophilus, to, to, to find out all the facts about this man named Jesus. And so, in the second chapter of Luke, Luke records uh, about this man named Simeon. And we don't see Simeon, Simeon in any of the other three Gospels. Uh, he's only got a few verses devoted to his name. But... I feel like that we can learn a lot from Simeon. I feel like he has a lot to offer. And the first thing I want us to realize about Simeon is that we really don't know much about him. We don't know what he done for a living. We don't know how much money he made. Uh, we don't know uh, if he had a family. We don't really know anything about this man named Simeon. But I feel like that we know enough about Simeon okay I think that even though we only know four things about Simeon I think that we know enough to say that Simeon is living a what a life well lived and so here's the four things that we know about Simeon we know that he was a righteous man he was a devout man he was living in expectation of what God was about to do and he was led by the Holy Spirit. And so, I feel like that's a pretty good description. And if at the end of my life, if, if that's all that could be said of me, I think I would be satisfied. That I was a devout man, a righteous man, living in expectation of what God was about to do. And led by the Holy Spirit. I feel like that Simeon was living a, a life well lived. And if we had to describe the life of Simeon in one word, I think it could be anticipation. That he was anticipating the Lord coming. And so Simeon had been promised by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he seen Jesus. And so his whole life, we don't know how long he waited we don't know how long uh, it was between when God spoke to him and when he actually got to see. It could have been days, months, weeks, years, or decades. But Simeon lived his life waiting to see what God would do. And I feel like that anticipation is what this Advent season is all about. And so... Advent is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And it's all about looking forward to see what God is about to do. And so Advent is not just us lighting candles. It's, our, it's us preparing our hearts to see what God will do in the next season of our life. Advent is not just lighting candles. It's a way that we live. It's living life in expectation of what God is about to do in our life. And so in our story we see that Mary and Joseph have just had Jesus. Okay? And so we all know the story, you know, wise men, shepherds, donkey, Bethlehem. We all we've all got that, I think. But right after that, what, what we, we, we miss this part of the story sometimes. According to Jewish law, after a woman had gave birth, she was ceremonially unclean for 40 days. And so she wasn't allowed in the temple. And after 40 days was up, she had to come to the temple and give a sacrifice. And according to the Jewish law, you had to... Give your firstborn son to God. And then when you, after you had given him to God, you would buy him back with a price uh, called a redemption price. 
And so that's what Mary and Joseph are doing in the temple on this particular day. Simeon's led at the same time into the temple. And when he sees Mary and Joseph, he just goes crazy. He runs over and he, he picks up this baby. We, we don't even know if he asks if he can hold him. He's just kind of like, give me that baby. And, and he starts singing and all this crazy stuff. And that seems a little over the top to us maybe. That Why was he so excited? And I don't feel like that... I don't feel like we understand the full weight of what was going on here. And so here's what, here's what we need to know. The, the Jewish people had waited on a Messiah for 4,000 years. 4,000 years. They had been promised in Genesis, I think it's Genesis 3... Right after the fall of Adam and Eve, God promised that I will give you a son who will crush the head of Satan. After the fall where they sinned and they messed everything up for all of us, God promised to set all of the wrongs right. And they had been waiting for 4,000 years on this promise to come through. But it wasn't just one promise. God promised over and over and over again in the Old Testament that He would send a son to set all of the wrongs right. He told Abraham in Genesis, in the middle of Genesis, that I will give you a son and all the nations of the world will be blessed because of him. And so every Jewish mom wanted their son. To be this blessed son who would change the way the world worked. Everybody wanted their son to be the one who changed the way everything worked. And so what would happen, uh, there was as many Messiah sightings uh, at the time of Jesus as there was Bigfoot sightings uh, in America today. And so every time somebody showed a little bit of potential, every time somebody uh, seemed to be a good warrior or a good soldier, they would say, maybe that's the Messiah. So they were always looking, always hoping that the Messiah would finally come because here's what they believed. They believed that when the Messiah came, he would destroy the Romans And that Israel would rule the entire earth. They did not expect Jesus. They expected a king who would come in and destroy all of their enemies. But they waited 4,000 years and they kept looking and they kept looking and they kept looking. And everybody, every time that somebody showed potential, they'd say, that's the Messiah. But every single time they were let down. Every single time it just didn't turn out. Turn out. The Messiah had been prophesied by prophets in the Old Testament over 350 times. So God had told Israel that I am sending you somebody to set you free 350 times in the Old Testament. And they had waited 4,000 years. And so sometimes we limit the Christmas story to just a a baby in a manger with donkeys and wise men and shepherds. But the Christmas story is so much bigger than that. The entire Bible is the Christmas story. And so in this Advent season we recognize that God made a promise. We recognize that God promised a son and on Christmas Day we realize that God kept His promise. And so Advent is a promise made and Christmas is a promise kept. These people were expecting a victorious king but what they got was the son of a young carpenter and a teenage girl. 
It was highly unexpected. It came from a place where nobody saw it coming. Nobody predicted Jesus to be the Messiah. He was just the son of a carpenter who, whose fiancée was pregnant before they were married. Mary could have been on 16 and pregnant. He came out of a place of shame. He didn't have much potential by the world's standards, but by God's standards, it was a whole different story. For God, He was the answer to a promise. He was the completion of a promise. Because God always keeps His promises. God always keeps His promises. And I could imagine that the people of Israel, they had begun to doubt whether God was really going to send a Messiah. I mean, 4,000 years? 4,000 years. 4,000 years. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus uh, was born. Uh, just imagine another 2,000 years. And they had waited on a Messiah. God, when are you going to send this? When are you going to finally set us free? They lived in anticipation. And Simeon is a perfect picture of this. He was looking to see what God would do. And so this week as I thought about the word anticipation, I wanted to know exactly what it meant. And anticipation means to look forward and to expect. To look forward and to expect. And I needed a little bit more clarification than that, so I went and looked up expect. And so expect, in the archaic, it means to wait. And so to anticipate is to look forward and to wait. And I believe that that's what some of us need to do in this season of our life. We need to look forward to what God is about to do. And we need to wait on Him to do it. See, here's, here's how I feel. I had much rather be waiting on God than have God waiting on me. I had rather put the ball in God's court and say, God, you will have to move than for God to put the ball in my court and me never move. Because God will do what He says. He will fulfill His promise. And so Simeon was looking forward to this fulfillment of a promise and he was waiting on God to come through. It looked impossible because it had been so long. But God always keeps His promises. God can be trusted. God can be trusted. He can be trusted. It may have felt like He didn't hear your prayer. It may feel like He's never going to come through. It may feel like things are never going to change, but God can be trusted. Just wait on Him. Wait on His time. You can count on God. It doesn't matter what the circumstances, what they may look like. Because even in an impossible situation, God can still move. In this season of Advent, it reminds us that God still makes promises. And better yet, God still keeps promises. Simeon had been promised that he would get to see the Messiah. And I'm sure he was looking for a king, but when he saw that baby, he knew that he was the one. And he wrapped him up in his arms and, and I'm sure he was thinking that, you know, this baby is going to set Israel free from Rome. I'm sure that he was thinking that this baby, it's going to do amazing things, and it would. 
But he, he did not come to do all the things that the people expected him to do. Because here's the deal. God doesn't always answer promises the way you think he will. Israel was expecting a military force, a victorious king. But they got a suffering Savior. See, Jesus didn't come to set them free from Rome. He came to set them free from sin. They had low expectations on God's promise. They just wanted to be set free from Rome, but Rome was really no problem. God knew what they really needed. They needed to be set free from their sin. And so we may have low expectations on God. We may think we need one thing in the immediate, in the now, but God knows what we truly need and He will give it to us in His time. And I thought this week about about that little baby. I bet Jesus was a cute baby, maybe. But that baby, he didn't stay a baby. That baby would grow up and he would grow up under the hand of Rome. And he would grow up and he would live this perfect life and he would be betrayed by a friend. He would go through all the hurts and the problems and the things that we go through. He was betrayed by a friend. And then the religious establishment of the day turned on him. The high priest turned on him. And he was executed by the Romans. You see, the Christmas story, it does not end... It does not end at the manger. It's so much bigger than that because Jesus would, they would take him to a cross and they would hang him there. And he would die on that cross. And in that moment when he died, he fulfilled the promise of God that Satan's head would be crushed. You see, when Jesus died, it wasn't, A military victory. It was victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. It was so much more than anybody had ever predicted. God wants to do more in your life than you can even predict. And they would take Jesus and they would take him off that cross after he died. And they would lay him in a borrowed tomb. But it was a good thing it was just a borrowed tomb because he didn't need it long. He would lay there in that grave for three days, but three days later, he would come out of that grave. And he would declare victory over everything that holds us back. He would declare that the promises have been kept. Have been kept. And after he rose from that grave, he took his disciples up to a mountaintop and he said, Boys, I'm leaving for a little while. I'm leaving for a little while, but let me make you a promise. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And for you and I today, I know it seems like a long time since the promise was made. But just like Simeon waited for his coming king, you and I are to look for our coming king, our resurrected Savior. In this Advent season, let's not look for a baby in a manger, but let's look for a coming victorious king. We serve a king who already has the victory. Jesus is coming back. It's not something to be feared. It's something to look forward to. It's something to to be excited about, to anticipate. When will He come? 
when will he come? The king is coming. Let's be looking for him when he comes back. Pray with me if you would this morning. God, we love you this morning. We thank you for what you're doing. God, we we want to live our lives in holy expectation of what you want to do for us. God, we realize that you want to do far more for us than we even realize. God, we thank you this morning that the Christmas story is not limited to a baby in a manger. But God, that it's about a Savior on a cross. That you invaded earth, that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And God, that you came to set us free from our sin. God, we love you so much. And God, we're looking forward. To Jesus coming back. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, accepting Jesus, belonging to Jesus, becoming a friend of Jesus is as simple as believing that message. The Bible says that when you believe that Jesus was who He says He was and done what He says He was done, you're saved. You're saved. So if you want to talk about that this morning, I would love to talk to you. Or if you have something you need prayer about, I'd love to pray with you. But this morning, the altar is open. I love you guys.